Hello and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. As always, my name is Caleb Denby and I am your host for today. And today we are going over the rest of the variations in the Bishop E3 line in the Nidorf, the English attack. I also wanted to go over some of what I went over last week once again now that I have everything here in front of me and I actually remember what I'm talking about. So let's uh, just jump into it here. So of course the bishop e3 Nidorf arises after e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, takes takes, knight f6, knight c3, a6, and bishop e3 entering the English attack. And last week we took a look at all of the lines involving e5, knight b3, followed by f3, sort of the main stuff in the English attack. This is the traditional way that white plays to go for an advantage, trying to push on the king's side and checkmate the black king. Uh, after bishop e6 for black, white would love to play the move g4, but unfortunately black can uh, strike back in the center with an immediate d5 in a good position, as g4 weakens this diagonal just a little bit too much. So much better for white is the main move, queen d2. And now I was recommending for black the uh, line that we see actually sort of the most at the top level these days with h5, just stopping g4 in its tracks. And from here, we took a look at three options for white in the previous lecture. We saw bishop e2, we saw the immediate knight d5, and we saw queenside castles. So uh, bishop e2 was sort of, uh, I think, one of the better lines for white. Knight d5 is kind of just a worse version of bishop e2. It's a bit too quick to play knight d5. It allows black to play in the following manner, which I'll go over in a second, actually. Uh, but queenside castles is sort of the more aggressive line. It's the threatening variation to black, where white tries to checkmate him. And we were looking at knight bd7. And here, the main move by far is king b1. Uh, from here, the move I recommended was the immediate b5. And then we got into uh, various different approaches for white. I should say king b1 is pretty much always played for white in these positions. Your opponent might start with one of these other options first, followed by king b1. But he's sort of going to owe this tempo on king b1 uh, until he actually plays it. Uh, the reason for that involves uh, the black pieces coming to the c-file quite early on, as well as threats of this bishop uh, taking advantage of this pawn being pins or this pawn on a2 being a bit weak. Uh, things like queen a5 can come in some cases as well. So king b1 pretty much always played for white here. Uh, and now after b5, uh, white does actually have, I would say, four or five main options. Really, only three moves get played a lot, but then there are a couple other options that you might see white go for. By far the most popular here is to go for knight d5. And this isn't going to be very threatening for black anymore. The reason for that is we can take this guy off the board after e takes d5. Thanks to uh, black's opening play, we can immediately play knight b6. And the pressure on this pawn is significant enough that white just has to give up his dark squared bishop. And once this bishop is off the board, things are going to be pretty comfortable for white. There's simply no other way to defend d5. So bishop takes b6, queen takes b6. And from here, knight a5 is leading into a pretty comfortable endgame. Rook c8, if knight c6, we get the endgame after knight takes d5. Sorry, knight e7, knight e7, queen d6, takes, 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 knight back to c6. And this endgame is just simply fine for black. In fact, I would probably rather have the black pieces than the white pieces here. And that sort of shows in the database scores here. I don't see any games that white ended up winning. And there are a few sort of scattered about that black actually did manage to win. Uh, backing up, though, instead of knight c6, what happens if white just tries to keep the position alive with something like bishop d3? Well, you're sort of uh, asking for trouble. For one, this pawn may or may not be hanging. There's bishop f5 tactics, but we don't even have to worry about all of that. Black can just continue the game with something like b4. Now, knight c4 should be played since white didn't go for knight c6 on the previous turn. No reason to do it now when you can no longer play queen d6. And from here, the simple queen c5, knight e3, 
and after a5, for example, black's play is coming uh, faster on the queen's side than white's play is elsewhere on the board. Uh, and so black is, is just going to have a pretty comfortable edge here in these positions. So how did we get here? Well, we got here from this move, knight d5. So king b1 followed by knight d5 is the most popular option for white in this position, but it's very much comfortable for black after this idea of knight b6. And then here, really the only way white plays is with knight a5 if white tries something else. For example, some slow move like a3. Black's going to be happy to castle, play moves like a5, play moves like b4, and just pressure on the queen's side. Uh, and once again, it's going to be comfortable for black. So instead, they all play knight a5, going for c6, and after rook c8, we either get the end game with knight c6 and takes, or a middle game after bishop d3 and b4. And black is doing quite well. So that's the main option. There's also f4. This is sort of the plan that you'll see players with the white uh, pieces go for uh, quite often against this h5 idea. h5, of course, preventing g4, but players with the white pieces then sometimes switch to this f4 plan because g4 no longer works. Uh, and here, the best move I could find for black is actually queen c7. I thought this was the best way of doing things uh, for black. And the reason is, now after f5, black is very happy to place this bishop onto the c4 square. If this trade ever happens, uh, b takes c4 is quite strong when this knight is more or less stuck. And black or white is going to have a very tough time on the, on the queen side. And if this trade doesn't happen, if white plays some uh, random move, well, once again, black is ready to expand on the queen side with something like b4, a5 to follow as well. We can also castle, bring the other rook into the game. And once again, black is doing pretty well here. So f5 is no longer really a good move after the move queen c7. Uh, much more common is this move, knight to d5. And now we can take on d5, take on d5. And here, knight b6 is not going to be quite as good because f takes e5 is kind of just winning a piece. So we shouldn't play knight b6 in this case after knight d5. f4 has done a good job of preventing that, but black is fine with just castling. Now, after something like g3, trying to get this bishop to a useful square, rook fe8, h3, and knight e4 uh, has been quite good for, uh, for black historically here. Uh, queen g2, for example, ef4, gf4, bishop f6. And this position has been reached 10 times, and all 10 times it ended up drawn by fairly high-level players. And black is, uh, like I said, just doing totally fine here. As for how this middle game is going to shake out, well, there are a few different ideas for black. There's actually an idea of playing h4 and trying to plant this knight onto g3 that black can look for. Black, of course, can also look for the classic uh, queen side pressure with stuff like a5 and b4. And black can also try and pressure this pawn just a little bit. Play something like knight b6, go for knight a4 with pressure on the queen side, or just leave it on b6 with pressure on the d5 pawn. And with all these ideas combined, uh, black is, like I said, pretty comfortable in this position. In the meantime, white is likely going to try something like bishop d4 and play for some pressure on the g-file, which is why this idea of h4 in knight g3 is so common and is uh, pretty reasonable here. Okay, so that's the main idea of f4. In the previous lecture, I also mentioned h3, which can be, be responded to with h4 to make sure that g4 sort of never happens. And then from here, bishop d3, queen c7, and f4 is sort of the idea. But now white is just sort of always getting a worse version of the lines that we just looked at because black has gotten to play, uh, gotten to insert h4 and h3, which is definitely advantageous for black. So h3 doesn't make as much sense. There's also g3, which has sort of the idea of either playing f4 or once again going for a later g4 by preventing h4. And here, once again, queen c7 is just a very good move to activate the queen, defend e5 indirectly, and prepare knight b6. Knight d5 takes takes, knight b6, and we are back, back towards that knight d5 business that we were looking at earlier. And so these are really 
uh, sort of all of the main options here for white after queenside castles. And black is equalizing, and in some cases, grabbing a small edge against uh, pretty much all of them in a, a very similar way against everything. OK, so that's my recap of the queenside castles variation. I do want to briefly mention this knight, uh, this bishop e2 move. So h5 here, queenside castles, what we just recapped. Also recapping bishop e2. The idea I wanted to show uh, last time is after knight a5, this is sort of white's only try to put pressure on the queen side. Here, my big idea was to play queen b8 to get rid of this knight with bishop d8 to follow in order to challenge this guy. And just one example line that I showed, h4. Um, sorry, not h4. Uh, I was looking at the wrong thing. Just kingside castles. And now the point for white, uh, sorry, the point for black is that uh, after c3, which is the normal move against queen c8, bishop d8, there's no knight c4 because our queen is already defending this d pawn. This is sort of the improvement that I came up with. And now b5 is coming very, very quickly, and black is better. So instead, white should play c4, and after bishop d8 now, uh, rook a c1, for example, bishop back to g6, bishop d1 is the best way I found for white to try to make progress. And here, I think knight c5 is equalizing for black. Nothing better for white to do than play bishop c2, accept this trade. And now we can go rook e8. White should try and make something happen while he still can. But bishop takes a5, bishop takes c5, bishop back, bishop f2. And after a5, uh, white has no real good way of solving these uh, challenges on the queen side. For example, after b5, we can go queen d8, challenging this square. And black is, is doing all right here. Uh, black probably isn't much better, but black I don't think is worse either. OK, so that's my recap of the previous lecture. Of course, I did such a long recap today because the previous lecture was sort of plagued with some difficulties involving Lee Chess going down minutes before the lecture started. So I sort of didn't have any of my prep in front of me. But here it is, the fully prepped 15-minute uh, version of that lecture last week. So now, let's get into the new stuff for this lecture. There are two new things I want to look at. One of them is early deviations after 7 knight b3. Uh, so after e5, knight b3, bishop e7. Last week, we covered all the lines where white goes f3 and queen d2. And now I sort of wanted to talk about the other options that white has in this position, besides for going for this classical f3, queen d2 plan, and then going into one of those three options that I just discussed, knight d5, bishop b2, or queenside castles. So after f3, white is sort of committed to this plan, but white can try and improve upon it by leaving this pawn back on f2. And sort of the best, I think, deviation for white this early on is this move uh, h3. So I'll talk about h3, but first I do want to mention the natural looking bishop e2 is actually just transposing to something we've already covered after bishop e6. Uh, and the reason for that is you can also achieve this position by playing bishop e2 here, bishop e7, bishop e3, and bishop e6. So this has already been covered in the bishop e2 lecture, so check that one out if you want. This is perfectly playable for white, but it's just a totally different way of approaching the position than the bishop e3 lines tend to be. Uh, so not bishop e2 here, because bishop e2 is a just a different line in the Nidorf, but I think h3 is the best deviation that still keeps with the ideas of the Nidorf, or the, the English attack in the Nidorf. Uh, and the point of h3 is that by using this pawn to control g4 instead of the f pawn, white leaves his options open to play f4 with a bit more force, meaning he's not stutter stepping, he's not going f3, f4, he's playing f2 to f4 in one go, not wasting this time. Uh, that being said, I do think that black's best response to h3 is still bishop e6. And this might not be what you expect if you know a little bit about uh, playing against f4 in the Nidorf. So bishop e6 is sort of a move that 
makes f4 a bit more strong. The reason for that is after bishop b6, f5 is always going to come with tempo, whereas it wouldn't come with tempo normally. Uh, that being said, I do still think bishop e6 is the best idea, because if black kingside castles here, which is the other natural option, then I do think g4 is actually quite strong. And this is sort of exactly what players playing the English attack are looking for. They're looking for black to castle, then they can play g4 and play for mate on the king's side. And I just wasn't so comfortable uh, looking at all these positions. So I am going to recommend bishop e6, even though white's idea was sort of to play f4 anyways. And the thinking here is that it's a lot like the variations with f4 that we saw in the bishop e2 lines. But in this case, white's tempo that he saved, quote unquote, is to put this pawn onto h3, which is somewhat useful, but it's not the most useful. And it also weakens this diagonal a bit, which white might not be so happy about in the future. So f4, I do think, is the critical try here. But let's take a look at what happens. We take on f4, bishop takes f4, and we can develop this knight out to c6. And this is sort of the position that we have. And in general, I do think that these positions tend to be pretty uh, comfortable for black, if not for white's next move. Uh, for example, if white sort of just started developing normally, something like bishop uh, to d3, black could castle, queen e2, and uh, something like knight e5, b5, a5, all of these ideas are quite comfortable for black here. But white can sort of force the issue with the immediate queen e2. This is uh, kind of causing black some temporary difficulties if he isn't very careful. For example, kingside castles might be a pretty devastating mistake here after queenside castles when there is a lot of pressure on the d-pawn and e5 is coming quite, uh, quite quickly. So rather than kingside castles, I am going to recommend the move knight e5, with the idea being we're stunting this bishop uh, immediately, we're preventing this pawn from ever having the idea of moving to e5, and we're going to play a few more useful moves in the center before we castle our king. Spending this tempo to castle is sometimes a little bit too early here. So queen side castles, and now because we played knight e5, we are quite ready to jump back with knight f to d7. Notably, if this knight was on c6 and we had castled, then the d-pawn would actually be hanging here. So we play knight e5 and knight fd7 immediately in order to avoid uh, having this issue. And this is a good way of responding to, uh, to this queenside castles idea with this annoying rook on d1. Uh, now white once again has nothing better to do than play king b1. He can play something like knight d4, but this isn't too threatening now for black. He can go ahead and just castle if he likes. And if this knight lands on f5, black is usually very happy to take this, but he doesn't even have to here. Rook c8 is also perfectly playable. And we'll get positions similar to what we're going to see with white once again eventually playing king b1 in almost every case because these weaknesses with the king on c1 are sort of just too great to, uh, to handle with white. So backing up, king b1 first is by far the most common move here. And now I'm just going to recommend that black goes ahead and castles. We've dealt with the center enough, and so we can take the time to castle our king. Uh, and this is the one line where uh, white is actually still managing to play this g4 move. He does get g4 in here. And so you might be saying, well, isn't this what he wanted? He played the English attack. He wanted to play g4. I should be scared now. And the answer to that is I think this is a very, very tame version of the g4 attacks that white generally gets in, in the Nidorf. The reason for that is this trade of the e-pawn for the f-pawn. This trade gave black some temporary problems in the center, but now that black has solved those problems, he has a very powerful knight on e5. He's already removed this knight from f6, allowing the black pieces to control the king's side. And this bishop on e6 is still sitting with uh, some very good scope here. And due to all that, I do favor this position over most of the positions that black gets in the standard English attack with g4 coming on the board. Uh, OK, black can play very naturally now, bringing a rook to the open file with rook c8s. And it's about time for white to try and develop this piece. So queen e3 now makes the most sense. 
queen c7 is always an improvement for this queen. And now I think the most ambitious try is to play g5, trying to push these guys forward for uh, an attack. But black is ready to meet it on the queen side with something like b5. And play might continue with rook h2 to guard the c2 square, knight b6. And now the most common move here is queen g3, so we'll just stick with that for the moment. And uh, now we would like to play knight a4 in some cases to get rid of this knight, but thanks to queen g3, uh, this is not so playable. Notably, if uh, black, white hadn't put this rook on h2, then knight a4 would be a very, very strong threat because c2 would be hanging. But after queen g3, a bit simpler, is rook f to e8. Now h4 continues the attack. And we'll play knight a4 anyways. Knight takes a4, b takes a4, knight d4. And after something like bishop g4, rook e1, rook b8, it's just a uh, pretty complex middle game position here. Uh, black should not ever really be worse in this position. These open files in front of the white king, in fact, mean uh, that black's attack is sort of ahead of white's uh, as far as time is concerned. But, you know, white definitely still has threats on the king's side as well. Uh, some potential ideas here for black include dropping this bishop back to h5 to keep things a bit more blocked off. Definitely dropping this bishop back to f8 is always an improvement for black as well, opening up this rook on the e-file and defending this knight. Also stepping out of knight f5. And, uh, of course, there are attacking ideas like eventually playing a3. Sometimes there's rook takes b2. You can try and double these rooks on the b-file as well, or drop a rook over to c8. And all of these ideas are uh, coming into play in, in these positions. Um, OK, so I will open it up to questions for just a moment. I'm going to recap how we got here uh, very quickly. So we got here from this move, 8h3. Uh, not f3, and the idea is after bishop e6, now white can launch this pawn up to f4. We saw takes, takes, knight c6. Queen e2 is the only try for an advantage from white, and now we have to play very quickly in the center with knight e5, knight fd7, and only then castling. Then I went on a bit further. Uh, I think this is sort of where you can call the, middle, the start of the middle game. White and black can both start deviating here without too many consequences. But we looked at g4 because it looks very aggressive. Bringing a rook to the open file is very common. Queen e3, queen c7, always an improvement for black to put the queen on this square. g5, b5, rook h2, knight b6, queen g3, rook e8. And then we even went a few moves further with knight a4 as an idea and bishop g4, and then we're coming back to b8. OK, any questions on this line as I pull up the chat here? Why is knight c6 better than knight d7? So in general, whenever this trade happens on the board, it is pretty advantageous to put this knight on c6 rather than d7. And the reason for that is because it becomes a lot more important to control the d4 square in many cases. The knight on c6 needs to control it because this pawn no longer does. And the knight on, on d7 in this particular case is also interfering with the queen's access to d6 and would just hang a pawn. Um, but in general, whenever this trade happens, it's good to put the knight on c6 to guard d4. But defending d6 uh, by not interfering with the queen is also very much a main reason for it. Good question. Mm -mm. Doesn't g6 stop white's play? So in that, those final positions, I don't like the idea of g6. And it's for almost the reason that you mentioned. It's because h5 and h takes g6 is successfully opening a file for white. Uh, once that h file gets opened, things can get very dangerous. h6 is also an idea, like h5, h6 for white. But I do think h takes g6 is. Uh, generally a bit more uh, tough. Any concern with knight d5? OK, let's take a look. Knight fd7. And yeah, knight d5 here does not tend to be uh, too uh, challenging for black. It's been played a few times. It looks like even Topolov has played this, which I did not 
uh, actually realize. But we will gladly snag this knight off the board. And after e takes d5, we can castle. And it's true that white, for the moment, has this extra bishop. But there's always these nice ideas of bishop g5, for example, in many cases, to get rid of these bishops and activate the rest of black's pieces. And with the straight open e file, uh, black has very natural piece, very natural squares for his pieces. Uh, rook takes d5 is also playable to keep this guy open, but it's going to be similar to the positions we just looked at, just with the exception of you know these two pieces being traded off. Uh, white definitely can do this. Uh, should he do this? It's a little bit unclear. But it's not going to change the ideas in the position. The ideas are all going to be the same. You're going to play b5, you're going to play rook c8, queen c7, go for knight b6 to a4 in most cases. Uh, also, potentially coming into c4, of course. And the same ideas of stopping white's play on the um, king side. Now, why doesn't white do this? Well. I think in general, the knight on c3 does tend to actually be a reasonable defender of the white king. And so while the bishop was doing a good job of defending light squares, this knight was a good defender as well. Good question. Good question. All right. Let's, uh, why doesn't knight takes d6 work? Well, uh, hopefully in all the positions we saw, we are defending we are defending the d6 pawn. Um, I'm looking. I'm looking. I don't see how the d6 pawn uh, is ever captured. All right. Let's move on to the next variations. So this was 8h3 with the idea of 9f4. But there's actually a second idea for white after h3 instead of f3. And that idea is to play the move queen f3. This is also a perfectly playable idea for white. Uh, however, with queen f3, white is very much giving up this idea of f4. Uh, obviously not permanently, but for, for a long time. It's going to be a long time before white manages to move this queen out of the way and play f4. So that's the big downside. Since white has... Uh, sort of uh, prevented himself from playing this move f4, I am a little bit more comfortable with castling in this position. Uh, once again, the idea is actually to play g4 with queen f3. Because you can't play g4 immediately. Well, you can, but it's not very good. Because still, the immediate g5 is going to be nice. And you do still have this issue. What just happened? What just happened to me? Did I close this tab? Oh god, it's all falling apart. That's my favorite puzzle of all time. Is it? Yeah. I showed it in tactics time. All right, we're back. <laughs> I don't know what series of mouse clicks I just did to go to to to, uh, to mess things up that bad, but we're back. All right. Uh, so bishop takes d5, and you have these issues of this diagonal being open, is what I was going to say because of this move g4. So queen f3 is an attempt at an improvement on that after bishop e6, queen f3. Uh, because now, after castles, g4, the move d5 isn't going to be as good here. Uh, the reason for that is knight takes d5. But now, because the queen is on f3 instead of d1, white can queenside castle here. And black would get into, uh, actually, a pretty fair bit of trouble. Uh, so d5, not going to be the idea anymore. Uh, what can black do in these positions? Well, there's a very nice idea for black in these uh, queen f3 lines. And that idea is that white has sort of diverted this queen away from the queen side, and so black can start playing over there a bit faster. And the nice idea is to play this move a5. Uh, what is the point of a5? Well, the point is if white plays sort of nonchalantly with queen side castles, we're playing a4, and this knight really has no good squares to go to. If it comes back to d2, then a3, b3 is just destroying all of, all of white's dark squares on the queen side. And this idea is, is difficult to stop. Uh, I guess knight c5 is potentially playable here, but the same move is still going to be an issue for, uh, for white. These uh, dark squares on the queen side are going to be far too weak with white or with black getting all of this sort of with tempo. If 
For example, queen a5 is already causing some very serious uh, issues for white. So white can and should respond to a5, and there are two ways to do it. One is with the move bishop b5 to guard a4, but the more natural, perhaps, a4 is actually, I think, a little bit of a mistake here. And the reason is, while a4 stops a5 kind of permanently, it is giving up control of the b4 square. And because of that, either knight a6 or knight c6 are both really reasonable moves with the idea of using this b4 square uh, at, a, at a later date. We don't have to jump there immediately, but we will be able to jump there in many, many cases. Uh, there's actually also b rook takes c3 in this position with still ideas of the knight coming to b4 a little bit later on. Fun stuff. Uh, but even immediately, knight b4 here is not at all bad for, uh, for black, making good use of this square. And then once again, it's just going to be a middle game position where black is attacking on the queen side, stuff like rook c8, queen c7. And the only change now is that black is going to have a very active knight on b4, whereas he couldn't so much get this knight to b4 in many of the other lines with this pawn on a2 ready to come to a3. So sort of just an improvement over the normal stuff for black. So that being said, bishop b5 I think is a better try, because now if we try the same stuff, there is always going to be a3 to kick our knight away. Uh, now white can queen side castle. By the way, knight a6 is still I think a good move for black. And the idea is now we're not coming to b4, but we are coming in to c7 and driving this bishop away. Uh, white can just move back with something like bishop e2, but now black is ready to play something like queen c8 and go for a quick b5 in the future. For example, g5, knight back to d2, and b5 here is already uh, pretty good for black. Once again, just another middle game position Black attacks on the queen side, white attacks on the king side. Uh, okay, so a little bit of a better try might be bishop b6, still pre presenting some opening problems for black with the immediate pressure of the bishops. But here we can actually attack both of white's bishops now with knight d7, and he will have to give up one of them. In this case, bishop takes c7 is better, queen takes c7, and now white usually ends up playing a4 anyways now that this knight that was going to come to b4 is dead. Here there are a lot of ideas for black. Knight b6 is a very natural move, and after something like king b1, knight fc8, knight d2 for example, just putting some moves on the board, these aren't necessarily forced at all. Uh, once again, it's that same kind of middle game position, right? White is still pushing up the board on the king side, but the interesting, unique ideas for black here involve some ideas of occasionally capturing on a4, actually, with b5 to follow. And I also like this idea of playing queen c5 uh, and coming into b4 with some threats to the a4 pawn here as well. This, this move a4 does still weaken the b4 square, and even if the knight doesn't jump there immediately, it is very, very relevant. Uh, black can also occasionally play for some ideas of d5 here, depending on what white goes for. But uh, yeah, going to be another interesting position here as well. Um, okay, so that is this move, queen f3. I recommend we just castle, and it's true that white can play this move g4, but we're not so worried about it here, because we can just go with a5, and after bishop b5, knight a6, we do end up taking off one of these bishops for white or advancing very quickly with queen c8 and b5. Uh, OK, that is queen f3. And those are the main variations after white does play this move uh, h3 early on. Uh, so. Let's move on to the next, unless there are some questions. Mm -mm. Why not bishop takes b5? Ah, OK. Let me go back to it here. Sorry, not f4, but this position, I assume, is what we're talking about. Uh, queen c8, something like g5, knight d7, knight d2, and b5. Why not bishop takes b5? Well, this is a bit. Um, this is a bit tough. This is a bit tough for, uh, for white. This is one of the reasons 
why king b1 is played so early and so often. Yeah, OK. Uh, but black gave up b5 in return. Let's talk about that. Takes takes here, knight b6, king b1. So yeah, black is never really going to be able to play b5, which is why I mentioned some of these ideas of breaking loose these pawns using the pieces instead, right? There's this idea of knight takes a4, which is actually pretty relevant here. Um, and let me just try and show some example of how that might actually work. Um, let's say... Sorry, let's say knight d2, for example, queen here, rook e1 maybe, rook b8 even, white passes again, for example. And actually, OK, probably rook b8 here first makes a oh, OK, sorry, hold on, hold on. If white doesn't play knight d2, then maybe now the immediate knight takes a4 is, is already good. And the point is, if you take here, c2 hangs. If you take like this, then b5 and following it up with a4. And these sacrifices can sometimes be very, very useful for black. That's why I was playing the move knight d2 for white. So that's one way of breaking through on the queen side with this type of piece sacrifice if your opponent tries to prevent it. Some stuff like queen c5. And like I said, queen b4, a piece jumping into c4 could come, a rook capturing on c3 could come, and there's still plenty of ways to, uh, to attack on the queen side for black. Mm -mm. Uh, okay, let us move on then. So 8h3 was one deviation that we looked at. There are some other moves on move 8 as well. Um, actually, though, I think I've talked about just about all of them. Ah, yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention. So bishop e2 transposes the bishop e2 lines, which makes sense. Uh, h3 we just looked at. But there is this idea of playing queen d2. And after bishop e6, if white plays f3, White has directly transposed to um, to the normal stuff here. And sorry, let me just get my bearings really quick. Oh uh, yes, yeah, so sorry. If Bishop e6, then f3 would transpose to the normal stuff. But White can actually improve upon this by queenside castling first, knight bd7, and then playing f4. And so this looks a little bit uh, dangerous for black, actually. Black might be doing OK here, but I do think this is slightly dangerous. Because in this case, it's a lot like the 8h3 lines. But rather than spend the tempo on h3, white has gotten to spend the tempo by just castling directly. And that's why I think these lines are sometimes a little bit improved for white over those 8h3 lines. For that reason here, I was recommending that if white plays the move queen d2 first, it actually does allow black to play this move knight g4. And this is uh, sort of just killing the attack for white. Uh, play could continue with something like knight d5, taking advantage of the fact that black left this square behind. But now after knight takes e3, knight takes e3 for example, black is doing just fine after bishop e6. Uh, gone are sort of the days of this f3, g4 idea, because now the dark squares are just going to be far too weak for white. Because of that, the game's going to switch to be a little bit more positional, with white trying to take over on the e6 square, or the d5 square, rather. Uh, sorry, probably kingside castles now. And for example, knight f6, queen d3, castles, knight d5. Sorry, not queen d5, but knight d5. Uh, rook c8, knight takes f6, bishop takes f6, and knight back to d2. And after queen c7, this position was totally fine uh, for black in a position in a game uh, between Anish Giri and Darius Swirts. And black was doing all right here. Uh, like I said, this knight g4 totally changes the tone of the game. It's no longer really going to be this English attack, classical style match where uh, white castles queenside and tries to checkmate you. Knight g4 takes off this bishop, weakens the dark squares enough that white has to start trying to play for the d5 square. But black is going to be totally fine. And in fact, in that example game I mentioned, bishop takes e6 and f e6 was played, which sort of permanently solves the problem of the d5 square for black. So this queen d2 move, at first glance, looks very clever by uh, keeping the option open to play f4. But it does just allow knight g4 when this bishop is very much stuck on the e3 square. 
Uh, okay, with that in mind, I think that's pretty much all the deviations after the move knight b3, bishop b7 that white has. You can play h3 to try to be clever, and try to play queen d2 to be clever. You can play bishop b2 to transpose into the positional bishop b2 lines, or you can go for the main stuff with f3 that we talked about. Now, let us talk about something different entirely, which is what happens when white puts the knight on this square instead. So that is the next stuff we are going to look at. So, once again, all the same opening moves. e5, knight f3, bishop e7. And now bishop c4 is sort of the only idea for white uh, with putting the knight back on f3. And the reason for that is the knight on f3 doesn't really want to be here, right? It's sort of in the way. We had all these attacking ideas of f3 and f4, and now those are just illegal because we put our stupid knight on the stupid square of f3, and we can't play those moves. The one upside to knight f3 is that now the move knight g5 is legal. And uh, with this, white tries to make use of this diagonal to work together with this knight to control some of these light squares. This is why knight f3 is sort of a move. So bishop c4 is the only idea for white to really take advantage of this. Uh, now, black can simply castle. White will castle kingside as well. Once again, doesn't make as much sense to try to do queen d2 and castles queenside here, uh, just because this knight is very, very poorly placed to facilitate these attacking ideas. And without the knight on b3, it's much easier now to attack for black on the queen side as well. So white will kingside castle. And now black is just going to challenge the center directly with bishop e6 anyways, despite White having these knight g5 ideas, it still does make sense to just play bishop e6. Um, OK, from here, white has three main options. White can capture the bishop, white can move the bishop back, or white can defend the bishop with queen e2. So let's take a look at all three. Uh, first and foremost, what happens with bishop takes e6? Well, black recaptures. And from here, really the only idea uh, with bishop takes e6, is to follow it up with the move knight a4. Uh, and the point now is that white is very immediately pressuring the b6 square. Uh, note that if white tries something like knight, g f knight g5 here, the simple queen d7 is defending well enough, and now knight a4 is sort of prevented forever, which is why people don't play knight g5 first, they just go knight a4. So knight a4 first, and how can black deal with this? Well, I like uh, not knight g4, which goes into some very long complications, but knight f to d7. Uh, I like this move, just challenging these squares uh, on their own. And from here, if knight g5 now, we can take it, so that move has been prevented. But c4 is sort of a natural way of playing for white, to try and lock down on the d5 square now. But simple development for black is going to be good enough. Uh, for example, rook c1, knight c5, knight takes c5, d takes c5. And this structure uh, historically has been equalizing for black. Uh, it's true that white has a few targets with these three pawns, looking a little bit strange. But it's well worth it for black, because black is defending all of these important central squares. With this extra pawn on e6, he never has to worry about a knight ending up on d5, or any piece ending up on d5. And with his control over d4, eventually this move knight d4 is going to come on the board, and black will have good control over the position, in exchange for a slightly fractured pawn structure. Um, also notably, b6 is a really useful move for black. Uh, in order to defend this guy enough times to just not have to worry about it. So one way you might see the game progress is knight e1, queen d1, rook d1, rook d8, knight d3 for example, attacking both guys, but now b6 is good enough. And for example, f3, double double, bishop f6, king f2, and knight d4. And this was enough for a draw in a game between two grandmasters whose names I'm not going to try to pronounce. Well, I guess I am going to try. Glasman and Nimtz. Nimtz? N-I-M-T-Z. The more you know. Uh, yeah, this was good enough for a draw in that game. And I do think black is doing uh, just fine in this position. Uh, tough to make progress. OK. 
So like I said, normal development is fine. There is sort of one problem that white can try to pose, and that's to play the move queen b3 here, uh, attacking b7 before black gets organized. But this can easily be met with knight a5. The queen will move to d3. And then I like this reorganizing of the queen with queen to e8. Uh, it allows knight b6, but it's not such a big deal. The knight will come back. And now black will have ideas of queen g6 to follow as well with counterplay on the king's side in return for this backwards uh, d-pawn. And once again, I do think black is fine. For example, rook d1, rook c8, and black is, is OK. Queen g6 to follow. Mm -mm -mm. Um, OK. So those were the lines with bishop takes e6. Once again, the idea of bishop takes e6 is to play knight a4 and immediately put this pressure on the queen's side. But black can deal with it quite simply by playing knight f to d7, uh, stopping knight g5, and also stopping any piece from landing on b6. c4 is the try for an advantage, locking down all of these squares. But now simple development with this idea of knight c5, going for this change in structure with control over the d4 square. Uh, OK. Uh, option number two for white, instead of taking, is bishop b3, uh, just preserving the bishop for a moment. And from here, I do like just knight c6, developing this knight out. We could come to d7, but then I think you run into issues of knight g5 here. We need the square for the queen. So knight c6 instead is perfectly fine. Uh, and now, once again, there are sort of two ideas for white. White can develop with something like queen to e2, but now the idea of knight c6 is we're going to chase this bishop and make it make a, a definite decision here. And it turns out that this bishop should no longer trade itself off for this guy on e6, because in general, this does actually tend to be a favorable pawn structure for black. Uh, white can go bishop e6 in the initial position because he does get this immediate pressure with knight a4. However, that pressure is sort of absent here. For example, after knight a4, uh, we can do a variety of things, I think including the move b5. Although, no, this is, this is sort, of, sort of an issue here. Um, for example, rook b8, knight g5 gets a little too crazy. So not b5 here, but something like knight g4 would work quite well. Uh, if bishop b6, queen e8, and this pressure on the queen side isn't really amounting to much. It's much slower than the first variation that we looked at for white. OK, so instead, we see rook f to d1 be the most common move here. Uh, and now black is happy to snatch this bishop off the board with this knight. a takes b3, queen c7, and bishop g5. And white goes back to fighting for the d5 square. Uh, there's a variety of ways to play here for black, but the most concrete is actually to just go knight h5 when white should try and win this pawn. But it's just not meant to be after takes, takes, bishop f6, and bishop takes c3. Black immediately regains the pawn and has some very active pieces. Uh, two more moves, knight d4, rook fe8, and this position is totally fine. Uh, and was enough for a draw in Gadakomsky against Boris Gelfand, as well as a victory for black, actually, in a game between Viktor Bologin and Zahar Efimenko. Uh, the more you know. So black doing just fine in this position. OK. And so this is the idea of queen e2 after bishop b3. White can also play the much more immediate bishop g5. And now after knight a5, take on f6, take on f6, and jump this knight into d5 immediately. But the simple knight takes b3, a b3, rook c8, essentially playing the same way with black. Uh, black is once again doing OK here. And maybe the simplest uh, is to just go bishop g5. And white will want to kill off this uh, now active bishop on g5, as it is controlling some uncomfortable squares. So knight g5, queen g5. And after queen d3, there's a game between Yu Yang Yi and Magnus Carlsen from this year, actually, where Magnus just snatched on d5. And after queen d5, rook c6, this game was uh, drawn in the long run, with black not really having enough weaknesses for white to take advantage of, 
and White having a couple weaknesses of his own to deal with on the B file. Uh, okay, so that is Bishop takes E6 and Bishop B3 taken care of. There's also the immediate Queen B2 that can be played. And here I do like the line of B5 for Black. Once again, White shouldn't take on E6 because now Knight A4 is prevented entirely, but White can go back to B3. And now we get similar positions to what we just looked at uh, in the bishop b3 line. Black can go queen c7, rook fd1, knight bd7 now is actually going to be playable. Uh, the reason being, we played queen c7 first, and so this stuff is uh, not as good for white. Uh, the idea is rook f to c8, knight e6, queen c4, and we have made a threat to the knights and a threat to the pawns. If queen c4, rook c4, and white had better start paying attention to this knight. If he doesn't, then the move h6 is trapping this guy uh, pretty convincingly. Uh, okay, so after queen c7, we are able to play this improvement, knight b to d7 instead of, uh, instead of knight to c6. Uh, the game might continue with, um, sort of lost my place here. The game might continue with bishop g5. And now uh, black is very happy to bring a rook to c8. And white will be fighting for the d5 square, but black is going to be fighting for knight c5, as well as pressure down the c file. And those are pretty much all of the options here after... Um, after this idea of knight f3. So once again, I want to open it up to any questions that I talked about today. And in fact, I think this is the last line I had to cover in the English attack. So any questions you guys have about the English attack, anything at all in the entire English attack that you want to know, now is your time to ask me. Now is the time. And then I'll do a quick review, go through uh, hopefully all of the lines very, very quickly. Can I recap from 5a6? Yeah, I'll do that quickly. I'll do that quickly. But any questions at all before, uh, before I do the big recap here? Isn't it risky for black to castle before 9g5? I don't think so. I don't think so. None of the lines that we looked at here really involve black's king getting into too much danger with the line that I'm recommending. You can get into some danger if you play bishop e6 first. Uh, there's some lines here that get a little bit crazy. For example, knight d5, queen d7, queen f3. Things get a little bit wild if you leave the king in the center. But if you castle, then, um, then the black king is, is generally fine. Um, OK, well, let's, uh, let's recap. How to memorize it. You don't have to memorize everything. I'm showing very, very concrete lines if that's what you want, if that's what you need, is concrete lines to study, then I am hopefully giving those to you. But uh, hopefully you're also understanding a lot of these ideas that I'm mentioning along the way. The middle game ideas are just as important. Because the pawn storm is an option, uh, here it's, it's really not an option. And the reason is this, this knight is on f3. Uh, with the knight on f3, the pawn storms are, are generally always going to be good for black. For example, queen e2, bishop e6. If you try to queenside castle um, already, black is just going to be much ahead on, on the queen side with these attacks. And once again, the knight being on f3 is very much a hindrance to white and not, not a help with it blocking the f pawn. Uh, so yeah, these ideas are pretty much never seen. Uh, black is just too fast on the queen side for these to be good. Please show all of the reasons behind every move. I'll try. I'm trying. But let's take it from the top. So we are talking about the English attack in the Nidorf, which arrives from the main position of the Nidorf here. White plays the move bishop e3, denoting the English attack. The move for black is e5, as usual in the Nidorf, kicking this knight away. We just looked at all of the variations with the knight coming back to f3. You develop normally. The knight goes to f3 to threaten knight g5, allowing white to take advantage of this diagonal. But black can meet this easily after castles, castles with bishop e6. White then has three main options, can take on e6, can come back to b3, or queen e2. 
takes on e6. The idea is the early knight a4, but black can combat this with knight f to d7, and will eventually play knight c6 and knight c5. White can play bishop b3, but now black is going to develop normally with knight to c6. For example, queen e2, knight a5, taking off this bishop, and once again, pressure down the c file. Or the immediate queen e2, when you get very similar things after b5 and bishop back to b3. Uh, queen c7, for example, and you can actually bring this knight out to the slightly better square on uh, d7. Okay, so that's knight f3. The main move, though, is knight back to b3. And then from here, we start with bishop e7. We took a look at all the early deviations with 8 h3, where we are still playing bishop e6 and responding to an early f4 with ef4, and knight c6 taking care to place these knights on e5 and d7 after the move queen e2 with the early pressure here. Then we castle kingside, and it's generally the, the standard play, attacks on the queen side, and black has good activity over here. There's also queen f3, and then here after queen f3, we took a look at, I believe, castles is what I recommend. And after the move g4, we go for an early a5, and white has to make some concessions to deal with this, namely bishop b5. And then we chase this bishop around and are ready to attack on the queen side. Okay, queen d2 is the only other deviation, but we hit him with an early knight g4. And now this completely changes the character of the game. Getting rid of this dark squared bishop means that white's dark squares are too weak to try to castle queenside, so he'll have to play for the d5 square instead, but black should be just fine. That just leaves the main stuff with f3, guarding the g4 square, bishop e6, queen d2, castles, and... Sorry, not castles. Not castles. Don't castle. <laughs> uh, h5 to stop white's ideas of g4. Uh, entirely, and then we saw the three main variations here with knight d5, which is actually the most common, but I believe the worst for white. Bishop e2, which is uh, in its, an improved knight d5 in my opinion, and the immediate queen side castles, which is the more standard attacking style game. To go through those quickly, I'm just going to jump to where I have those things saved. The knight d5 here uh, runs into knight takes d5, takes bishop f5 when this bishop is fairly active. So bishop d3 would make sense to trade it off, but then white doesn't really have enough attackers. So bishop b2 instead. And an early a5 is still a good idea to chase this knight around. For example, a4, uh, knight d7. And now if white still wants to castle queenside, he's running into rook c8s, and this is going to be awkward. So white should just castle kingside instead. And then we have a pretty easy position, once again, for black. b6, knight c5, uh, logical moves to follow. Uh, so that's the immediate knight d5. If bishop e2, this is an improvement over knight d5, because now after knight b to d7, knight d5. Uh, if we try the same stuff, knight takes d5 and bishop f5, what happens here? Well, now there's this move, knight a5 to take over on the queen side that we would have to struggle with. Uh, but in that line, still no need to fear. Let me jump over here. There's, like I said, the knight a5 idea, which shows up here. And the idea I introduced was this move of queen b8, with the idea of defending the d6 pawn with bishop d8 to follow to get rid of this annoying knight. The play might continue with castles, um, and what am I recommending? Castles. <laughs> uh, and now the standard way of dealing with the slightly more common queen c8 for white is to play c3, and after bishop d8, play knight c4, going after g6, but queen b8 has improved upon this line by defending d6 immediately, so black would be able to play uh, b5 here without uh, issue. Instead, white should go for the immediate c4, but bishop d8 is still enough for uh, more or less uh, equality. Last but not least, let's take another look at these queenside castles lines, which I reviewed at the top of the lecture. Black will play knight bd7, getting developed. And king b1 is always a useful move now for white. And let me just jump. This will be easier if I just jump to where the actual positions are. Knight bd7. 
And now, after king b1, uh, we see b5 for black, and white has a myriad of options, including knight d5, f4, h3, uh, those are the main ones, uh, as well as g3, we'll talk about. If the immediate knight d5, this is the most common, but it's also the least threatening because we can take, and after knight b6, white has no way to defend this pawn. So bishop takes b6, queen takes b6 is comfortable for black. Knight a5 is pretty much the only idea for white, but after rook c8, knight c6, knight takes d5, we get a comfortable endgame for black. In this line, takes in knight c6. Um, so knight takes d5, not threatening at all. We go knight b6, and then white more or less has to play this knight a5 five move, and black is doing well. f4 is the next most common idea, and this idea is a little bit better. Switching gears, g4 no longer playable after h5, so f4 instead. And there we saw queen c7, giving this c4 square for the bishop, if anything happens. And here white players tend to play this move knight d5 once again and we go back to stuff we saw beforehand. Not knight b6 here, because fe5 is good, but castles instead. And now g3, for example. Black brings a rook to the center, and there are uh, a lot of ideas here for both sides, just one of which involves putting this knight on e4, for example, and playing bishop f6, when black once again is ready to challenge the queen's side. Okay, so that's f4. There's also this move h3, which you can respond to always, or usually, with h4 to make sure g4 never gets played. And here, white players generally go back to the, these f4 ideas. But once again, they don't amount to too much. In this case, a lot of ideas of planting this knight onto g3 as well. Last but not least, if white tries g3, going for a super slow g4, or still occasionally f4, this isn't too threatening. We still go queen c7. And now if knight d, well, for one, if white tries the really, really slow approach of going g4 next, it's just way too slow. We have too much time to play b4 and attack on the queen side. And if knight back to d5, uh, once again, this knight b6 stuff is good enough for black. If f4, we've seen this stuff before as well. And now b4 is going to be a good move. With this idea, taking with the knight and immediate pressure on the king. And that is the entirety of the Nidorf English attack in about a five to 10 minute review there. Hopefully you guys understand everything there is to know now. If not, watch the two hour review of the English attack instead of the 10 minute version and you might have a better idea. Um, next week, I'm gonna move on to something different. Maybe it'll be the Bishop G5 Nidorf. Maybe it'll be a different line of the Nidorf. Who knows, but that is my entire coverage of the English attack. Hopefully you guys feel well prepared against this, which is, uh, I think, now the most common way of playing against the Nidorf. Uh, I think black has some really good chances in most of these lines, and hopefully you, you agree. That's going to be it for me here tonight uh, on Chess Openings Explained. Thank you guys so much for joining me, and as always, I will see you next time.